We made a date wine with dates. Now let's make it with syrup. Less mess. We hope. And here's how we're gonna do it. For this, you're going to need a one gallon fermenter. That's a US gallon, 3.75 liters for all of our metric friends. You need an airlock and a bung, preferably one with sanitizer fluid in it. But if not, you can use the cheap liquor of your choice. I prefer Scoresby for this. Hydrometer and graduated cylinder. Optional, but really recommended. Very, very good to have. We're going to be using Red Star Premier Classic yeast today, though you can use pretty much any yeast that'll go above, say, a 12 to 13% tolerance. 1.5 grams of Fermade O dissolved in a little bit of water, because, you know, you can teach old dogs new tricks. That's right, uh-huh. <laughs> Three pounds of date syrup. Now, I've never tasted date syrup, so we're going to have a taste of this in just a moment. And last but not least, one cup of tea. Today we're using PG tips because last time we used Yorkshire tea and we are equal opportunity offenders. But first, because we don't really know this product all that well, you gotta take a taste. What I've been told by people is that it tastes a lot like honey. Like they, it's used as a honey substitute in a lot of places. And of course they have one of these things on it that I'm not, I'm gonna tear it. He, than... he brutally massacres these things. Hey, it came off. Ooh, Look at that. Oh, yeah. it's really dark. All right, so this is a really gorgeous color, and I don't know if this is is showing you. I'm gonna try to get some light in there, but it's oh, yeah. like this beautiful reddish brown. It's just, I really like it. It looks like the avocado honey that we had. Yeah. Let's hope it tastes better than the avocado honey. <laughs> so, go ahead, take a take All a right. taste. All <laughs> right. Without making a mess. The whole idea was to make less mess with this one, because with the date wine, the dates just completely obliterated themselves and turned into this mash of oh, potent. goop in the bottom of the fermenter and it was just a nightmare to try to clean so it's like molasses and dates combined oh yeah oh there's a candy that was like a caramel -y. oh yeah and yeah i say it caramel it's c-a-r-a-m-e-l that's the way i say it because that's where i grew up a couple people have been giving me a hard time one guy said what's wrong with your brain for saying it that way really i'm people? not even kidding is that necessary it's not it's just how I, I say it it's how i grew up i think the candy you're looking for is rollos mm -mm. no no this one actually has like caramel in the middle and as you bit it it like stretched out i i don't know the name of these things okay. it was from when i was a kid okay so this has a really interesting flavor I wouldn't say it tastes like honey though. It's very, very different. It's more, like you say, molasses meets caramel meets sugary. I mean, it's really super sweet. Gonna be a really interesting wine, I think. I though. think so. And I do believe the black tea was necessary. I made some just in case the tannic aspect of it. Really, really kind of necessary. Yeah. Now I did learn that the pH on this is roughly the same as honey. Okay. So we don't have to worry about adding any acids or things like that. And based on the flavor, it's got a, a little bit of an acidity to it. So I, I think we're good there. But let's get three pounds of this into our fermenter. I've heard that it's roughly the same gravity as honey too. So we're gonna go with that theory. As this is very much like honey, it's a sticky mess in our funnel. So we're going to use our brains and we're going to use our warmish liquid of tea and pour that in next so that way it hopefully dissolves that and gets that all into our fermenter. Alright, so that worked mostly, but we also have to add some water. And what we like to do is add our water to roughly the halfway mark, so that way Brian can shake the bejesus out of it. Something else that I'm going to add, though, is our Fermate O, because it doesn't really dissolve too great, in my experience, so I want to make sure that this gets dissolved, so it'll get mixed in with all the bejesus and hopefully get obliterated. Now, to help with dissolving the Fermade O, he did mix some water in that little cup to make kind of a slurry, and that does help a lot. Oh, yeah. Oh, I Jim guess I'm going to do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the filling it halfway is like my personal little trick for getting a lot of aeration into a brew in the beginning. And I put in a solid stopper, also known as my thumb saver bung because that way there's no hole to hurt your finger as you're pressing. And this way, there's a lot of room for agitation. 
I can really give it a good shake. And you can see it's shaking up really nicely. This stuff is about as thick as honey or molasses, so it takes a while. Look at that color. It's like this reddish brown. Gee, it's the color of dates. Who'd have thunk, right? Now this shaking does two things. The primary reason for shaking it is to dissolve the sugars, make sure that they're equally distributed through your uh, must. So that way, when you take your reading, you are getting a more accurate reading. If you didn't shake it, then a large portion of your fermentable sugars would remain in the bottom. So when you took your reading, you wouldn't get an accurate reading. The second reason for shaking it is to oxygenate your brew. So that way, Brian is infusing oxygen throughout that, which is important at the beginning of fermentation to keep your yeasts happy. That way they can build up the colony. Once they've used up all the oxygen that's in there, you do not want to introduce more. So once they start producing alcohol is when, yeah, don't add more oxygen to it. So a lot of people get confused on that aspect. And if you think you're done mixing, you're probably not. Mix a little bit more. Now I know I'm done mixing. But is he? Not really, because we have it. to add some more water and then yeah, he's gonna have to mix yeah, it some more. Yeah. But a lot of the difficult mixing, which was getting those sugars dissolved and mixed into the liquid, that's been done, and that's why we do the halfway mark to start off with. Notice I washed my hands in... The red bucket of sanitization! Everything in here has been in there. And that is just a red bucket filled with sanitizer fluid. We just make it a cute jingle. That way you remember to sanitize, because it's important. All right. <laughs> I did create a good head of foam in here, which is going to prevent me from filling this to the top. You aren't too I good. know, okay. but I got a lot of foam. So what I'm going to do is just stir it around a little bit, try to break some of that up. It, it's part of the process. It just happens, and there's not much you can do. It does break up on its own eventually, and there's all kinds of methods people have told me to try. I could use Mega Maid and suck it all up, and I'm sure that probably works. Um, the one method that I was told to try that will work, but I do not wish to do because I could introduce problems, is use a wooden spoon. Because the wooden spoon would help break up all the bubbles and it would make it all go away. Yes, it would. However, you'd have to sanitize that spoon, and in sanitizing it, it actually loses the ability to break up the bubbles so well. So you kind of have a catch-22 there. So, ideally, we want our brew level to be past this curve of our fermenter. But because we have so much foam, Brian is concerned. And the biggest reason he's concerned about the foam is not because the foam's gonna come out, it's because once fermentation starts, if that foam is still present, then it is going to come out and make a big mess. Mm -hmm. So you know what? I think we're going to have to uh, suck out some of the foam. All right, so I don't normally do it this way, but in this case, it's so extreme. That is a lot of foam. So I'm gonna try sucking out some of that foam and put it into a, a container here. We might even be able to let it solidify and use it still. <laughs> really? Or not. It yeah, goes, I'm, goes I'm getting foam. <laughs> Mostly. I don't know how effective that really is. Not gonna bother. Let's put that in. I mean, <clears throat> more water. I like to live on the edge. <laughs> My real concern is that if this stuff really is as strong as honey, by not having enough water in there, I'm not really gonna get the gravity I'm looking for. I'm, it'll probably be, be too high because of concentration. I'm pretty okay with this though. This is starting to reach the shoulders and I think that foam will subside. I hope the foam will subside. Let's let's say that. Next, I need to mix this up a little bit more. Now, I don't want to mix it like I did before because I'll just be creating more foam. So instead, I'm just going to kind of do this. Sometimes this dissipates some of that foam too, but I want to make sure that it's all mixed together well. And it looks to be. That is a lot of foam. <laughs> it is a lot of foam. It looks like coffee though. <laughs> all right, so now we have everything in here, the water and the date syrup. So we're going to take a hydrometer reading just to get an original gravity and know what we're starting with and where it has the potential to go. I'm aiming for something around 1.100. Okay, so this may turn into a cautionary tale about how to handle this. But here's the problem. We have 
a lot of foam here that isn't going to subside, but I have a 1.144 gravity. That's really high. I don't like to have to ferment that high. It does give a lot of potential alcohol, but we only used a 13% yeast. So guess what I'm going to end up doing? We're going to dilute this a little bit once that foam dis dissipates. So for now, I'm just going to pour this back in. So this is the thing about homebrewing. It's all about problem solving. And you know, you never know exactly what's going to happen. You can kind of have an idea, but having a bunch of tools in your back pocket, so to speak, on what to do when is a really great way to go. And in this case, I know if this foam all goes away, I can put in probably another half a quart of water in there. That's going to change that gravity beautifully, probably down to a normal range for me, which is like, you know, 1100, 1110, something like that. I'm cool with that. So um, I'm actually not all that worried. See, look at this face. When I look nervous, you can get nervous. But, you know, now that we're talking about it, I will put in a little bit more water. So here's the way we're going to do this. I just added a little bit more water. We're going to give this a little bit of time, come back to it in, you know, half an hour or an hour. Hope that some of that foam goes away and then we'll add more water to it. Then we'll get a final reading, add our yeast, call it a day. So we are a very impatient people. Some of us more so than others. <laughs> So I got out our old trusty friend, the master baster, to suck foam. <laughs> because Mega May just really wasn't hacking it. And it was a process of sucking foam and adding water and sucking foam and adding water. And it was, it was tedious and annoying. And Brian just kind of watched me and shook his head thinking I would never be able to do what you're doing right and now. And I answered some comments on our videos. Yeah. But so we were still productive. We got our volume all the way up to there, which is pretty cool, but not as cool as what Brian's about to tell you. We actually took a new reading on it and it got down to 1.096. So you know what? Yay! Awesome job. And you know, because we're not most people, I'm just going to pour this right back in here because everything is clean. It's all sanitized many times, several times today already. <laughs> so yeah, not a problem. So at this point, the only thing left to do is to add our yeast. Now. There's a couple things I want to say about the yeast. This is Red Star, which I like Red Star yeast. I actually really like Red Star yeast. I think it's a great product. However, I can't get them open. And second, do you know what the alcohol tolerance of this yeast is? I didn't know what the alcohol tolerance of this yeast is. Reading the packet, I still don't know what the alcohol tolerance of this yeast is. That's kind of an important piece of information. Why do they not put it on the packet? You know how I found out? I had to go to Google, not even to Red Star's website, to another website to find out what the alcohol tolerance for this yeast is. It happens to be 13% in case you were curious, but why don't they just put it on the packet or at least make it easy enough to get? And I'll get off my podium and that's the end of my rant for today. But I'm gonna get out my MacGyver knife here because the scissors are way over there and that's like seven or eight wires to get there. So <laughs> I ain't crawling across. And I'm just gonna snip the tip. Now for a one gallon batch, all you really need is one teaspoon of yeast. Yeah, that's all you need, but I'm gonna use the whole packet because you know, this, I just don't wanna have problems. And I know from past experience that when you put in a whole packet, you tend to not have as many problems. Now I'm getting it all in there and guess what comes next? Thwack your packet. We totally have to make a t-shirt. That. that would confuse the heck out of people in stores and stuff. They'd be like, what does that even mean? And then they go home and look it up and probably find us. I think that'd be pretty cool. But yeah, there's tons of stuff in there and it just, yeah, it's all gone. All right, good. Now you really don't have to mix yeast, but what I want to do is just kind of get it absorbed into the liquid and get some of that off the side where I messed up and hit the side. Just stir it around a little bit. And then obviously, you know, bung and airlock goes on. As Brian said, the only reason why you want to stir it is to try to get it from sticking here yeah, like into that, being dude. down in here, but it is rather difficult to do. Yeah. And you know, I'll just do like that, make it worse. Yeah. It didn't help. <laughs> And those yeasts just will never see and fulfill their destiny. That's it. That, that, that's all there is to it. So that's another reason to use a whole packet. See, they're never going to do anything, so the rest of them have to make up for it. If I had only used the right amount, that might have been just the ones that were alive and the rest were all dead, therefore nothing would happen. It's my story and I'm sticking to it. So at this point, we're going to wait for fermentation to start and we'll be right back with you. So it's been about 24 hours. We got a mess. There's been some occurrences, you might say. <laughs> 
I gotta make a new label for one. Yeah, this is a prime example of why we suggest putting new fermentations in a edged tray. It captures all the stuff that comes out. Now, normally we wouldn't let this go. Once we saw it started to overflow, we'd have taken care of it right away. But, you know, for science, we like to let things go a little bit and show you guys what happens. So, what are we gonna do? I'm gonna pull that airlock out and clean it up and replace it and put it all back, clean up the bottle, make a new label, and let it go some more. Now, if we still saw all of this pushing up into the airlock, we would remove the airlock and switch this out to a blow off tube. Yeah. But since it has had time to erupt and then calm down, I don't really think a blow off tube is necessary anymore. I don't think so either. But what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna give it its swirl first. Oh yeah. That way in case it makes more mess. And this is gonna be a modified swirl. Now, a lot of people get really confused on the swirl. They say, "What? why do you do that? What is it for? How often do I do it? Should I do it all the time? I didn't swirl enough. Did I ruin my brew? No, you're fine. It's not that big of a deal. We actually did a video just on the swirl method, okay? What, what does the swirl do? Well, a couple things. It helps to degas the brew just a little bit. In the early phases, that's kind of a good thing so that you don't get more blowouts like this. <laughs> and it helps the yeast not have to swim in their own poop. And you can see it's erupting. That's why I did this before before cleaning it out yeah good call <laughs> and the second thing it does is if any of the yeast clump together or any of the anything clump together it um it gets it back into suspension so that we can actually let it do its thing oh boy i need a towel <laughs> okay so we've replaced the airlock we put a new label on and you can probably see let me let me show you See how the foam has died down? Just that little bit of swirling. There was just some foam built up in there. It doesn't look like it's going to erupt anymore, so I'm cool with that. Just put that label back on. And now we're going to refill the airlock. Now, if you were still in brew day mode and you still had clean sanitization liquid, you could fill this again with sanitization That would sanitization be my preferred liquid. method. Yeah, star sand. If you don't, you can use the cheap liquor of your choice or just something that you really don't like. I'm all out of Scoresby. So we got this Scorpion Douglas Mexican whiskey when we were in Mexico one time. It's gross. It is one of the few whiskeys that I've ever poured a glass of and literally dumped out after drinking some. We've had it for three years. Look how much is still here. I put it in a couple of airlocks. So that tells you how much I really like this stuff. Anyway, it's what I'm using today. It's just not good. Derek actually said, oh, should we use cheap vodka? I said, why? We won't drink this. <laughs> It's true. Now you want to make sure that you put your plastic cap back on, but you also want to make sure your plastic cap is perforated, meaning it has tiny holes in it. We have had other viewers yeah, tell us that crazy. their cap didn't have holes in it. Now some so, of them that didn't have holes had slits on the sides or something. Uh, so they're all a little bit different, but if it doesn't have holes, that's kind of a problem. It should have holes to let the gas escape. Otherwise it's going to blow the cap off or blow the airlock out. All right, so this is going to go sit in the fermentation station where it will sit for two, three, maybe even four weeks since this did start at a 1.096 gravity. And it'll just sit there and it'll ferment and do its thing. And then we'll be back with a reading. Thank you so much for watching. And have a great day. All right, so this is going to go sit in the fermentation station where it will sit for me two, three. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, so this is gonna go into the fermentation station at this point where it will sit for two, three, maybe even four weeks. I don't care.